Senator Wong. Thank you, um, President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the death of former Prime Minister of Japan, Mr Abe Shinzo. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted, Senator Wong. I thank the Senate and I move that the Senate records its deep sorrow at the death on 8 July 2022 of Abe Shinzo, the, largest, the longest serving Prime Minister of Japan, and places on record its acknowledgement of his role in the development of his nation and tenders its profound sympathy to his family and the people of Japan in their bereavement. President, on the 9th of 9th July, landmarks in my home state of South Australia were lit in red and white, the colours of Japan. Adelaide Oval, the South Australian Parliament, the Torrens Footbridge, along with the Sydney Opera House, the MCG and the Shrine of Remembrance in Melbourne, and many more around the country, all lit in solemn tribute to one of our nation's truest friends. It was a sign of the esteem in which former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was held across Australia. And I believe I speak on behalf of all Australians in expressing shock and grief at his terrible loss. And I express my deepest sympathies and those of the Australian people to Mrs Abe, Mr Abe's family and to the people of Japan. I echo Prime Minister Albanese's reflection of the bleak paradox that someone of such courage and strength of character could be taken away with an act of such cowardice. And I affirm the Prime Minister's vow that this low act of violence must not be allowed to overshadow a life that was lived to such high purpose. Mr Abe was the longest serving Prime Minister in Japanese history, but his contribution far surpassed the time he served. He was a political leader of consequence, who looked beyond election cycles and made a lasting difference. Transformative leaders are rare. Mr. But Mr Abe made Japan bigger in the world. He had a vision of a Japan that exercised a degree of influence in the world commensurate with its economic weight and cultural significance, and he helped Japan assume its proper place in the community of nations. Given our shared values and interests, this vision was also of great benefit to our country. Through his signature Abenomics agenda, Mr Abe sought to shape an enlightened activist role for government in stimulating economic growth. Tourism boomed, trade was liberalised, women were given greater incentives to enter into and stay in the workforce. Mr Abe also reformed Japan's security posture in ways that enabled Japan to play a greater role in upholding regional stability. And while these measures did not pass without some controversy in Japan, they were grounded in his conviction that Japan should be able to exercise the same rights as all other countries, such as the UN Charter's right to collective self-defence. His security and defence reforms enabled greater engagement and cooperation between the ADF and the Japan Self-Defence Forces. Japan is now Australia's closest defence partner in Asia. When he addressed the Australian Parliament in 2014, he spoke of his ambition for the relationship between Australia and Japan and how our two countries could work together to uphold peace and the rule of law in our region and beyond. He understood our partnership had been founded first on trade and investment, later complemented by our growing strategic and security cooperation and also growth in, in tourism, student exchanges and cooperation in the arts, culture, sport and research. It is a relationship between our two countries that is above politics, and I acknowledge the role of both parties of government in fostering that relationship. The deep affinity between our peoples has been a constant throughout, and I believe we all felt that affinity strongly in the presence of Mr Abe. His vision helped elevate our bilateral relationship to a special strategic partnership in 2014. He oversaw the signing of the Japan-Australia Economic Partnership Agreement the same year and gave impetus to negotiations towards our reciprocal access agreement signed in January of this year. Shinzo Abe was also a global leader, and he will be remembered as one of this century's most eminent political figures. It was during his first term that he revealed himself as a regional visionary, 
sowing the seeds of what would later become the concept of the Indo-Pacific in his speech on the confluence of the two seas at the Indian Parliament in 2007. Australia became the first country to formally adopt the Indo-Pacific as a regional frame of reference, in the Gillard, first in the Gillard government's 2013 Defence White Paper. And the concept came to define Japan's foreign policy under Mr Abe's second term, to shape the mission of the Quad and to frame the regional outlooks of the United States, ASEAN, European partners and others. And the elevation of the Quad in recent years owes so much to his energy and his statementship, as does the conclusion of the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. Shinzo Abe was a leader in the G7, the G20 and the United Nations, championing a vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific and an international order governed by rules rather than power alone. And despite regretting how much he had left to accomplish, by the time he retired due to ill health in September of 2020, Mr Abe had left a profound imprint on Japan and on the world. When he last visited the Australian Embassy in Tokyo in April this year, Mr Abe was as energetic and determined as ever to strengthen cooperation between Australia and Japan in the region and to see the free world combat Russia's aggression in Ukraine and to foster global peace and prosperity. These common values help explain why Australians have united in solidarity with Japan to express our grief at Mr Abe's passing. Many have described him as one of Australia's closest friends on the world stage. He visited our country five times as Prime Minister. Shinzo Abe was a statesman, a stabilising force in Japan, a giant on the world stage and a true friend to Australia. On behalf of the Australian Government and the Australian people, I again convey our sincere condolences to Mr Abe's family and to all of the people of Japan for this most terrible loss. Australia has lost a true friend and we mourn with you. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, uh, President. Uh, President, I rise to support the motion of Senator Wong and to associate the Liberal and National Parties with the words and sentiments expressed by Senator Wong. Like all Australians, I was shocked and deeply saddened to hear of the shooting in Japan which would take the life of Shinzo Abe. My hopes and prayers and those of so many Australians during the hours that followed that initial news that Shinzo Abe had been injured in a shooting were sadly, on this occasion, not to be answered. And it was within just a few short hours that we heard the confirmation of our worst fears for this great leader and for our friends in Japan. Shinzo Abe was truly a giant of democratic leadership in our time. He championed values that underpin peace, progress and opportunity. He demonstrated the value of economic liberalism. Shinzo Abe was the most transformational and consequential politician of Japan's post-war era. That he has had such an impact not only on his own country but in his own region and globally is a testament to the man and his legacy, a legacy that will endure. For his life to end in a brutal act in a country that in the modern era is renowned for its peaceful democracy is an affront against so much that so many of us in Japan and in Australia hold dear. It was an affront especially to the values that Shinzo Abe espoused in thought and in deed throughout his life. It is a sad reality that Shinzo Abe's death is yet another stark reminder, if indeed one was ever needed, that nothing can be taken for granted and that the fight to defend democratic values is one that never ends. That Shinzo Abe's life should end at the hands of a coward who fired what would be fatal shots at his back whilst he was participating in the democratic process he so strongly espoused, respected and loved makes the reality of this brutal act even harder to comprehend. As Mr Dutton, the Leader of the Opposition, said in marking the tragic end of his life, Shinzo Abe was well known to Australians as a sincere, staunch and trustworthy friend. It was my pleasure to have 
personally met on several occasions, engaged with and to some degree uh, as part of our government to government relations worked uh, with Shinzo Abe. I recall particularly having the honour of meeting him at the Darwin Airport, one of the five visits to Australia uh, that Senator Wong referenced that he made during his time as Japanese Prime Minister. Visiting Darwin, the scene of World War II bombings in Australia, was one of those integral steps that Shinzo Abe took as part of his efforts to reconcile Japan's difficult past. By reconciling with its past, Shinzo Abe knew that Japan would be better able to more strongly embrace its future. He was clear-eyed that the deeds of one generation should not consign future generations or Japan as a whole to being a second-class or lesser global citizen. Australia should be grateful that Shinzo Abe's work, including his redefining of Japan's constitutional restrictions, has enabled Japan to step up in a bilateral sense, in a regional sense and across the world. Whether it was that engagement on the tarmac at Darwin Airport in bilateral meetings I was privileged to be part of in Australia, Japan or Third Nations, I always found Shinzo Abe to be a warm, engaging, thoughtful but purposeful interlocutor. He made all those in the room feel like he had time for them, and he built personal connections that strengthened his status as a statesman of influence right around the globe. Even while speaking through an interpreter, Shinzo Abe was able to promote influence and charm in the most nice and calm of ways. I recall the first bilateral meeting between uh, Shinzo Abe and then Prime Minister Morrison that occurred uh, at a G20, where, again speaking through an interpreter, part way through we realised that in referencing the Prime Minister of the day, he continually referenced Skomo-san, <laughs> picking up uh, on the Australian approach for a little bit uh, of personal engagement uh, and uh, informality. There have been many tributes played to Shinzo Abe in the days and weeks since that terrible moment on July 8, which will be etched in the collective memory of Japan forever. His achievements have rightly been well documented. As Prime Minister, he travelled to more countries than any of his predecessors, expanding the reach of his diplomacy far beyond Japan's traditional partners. He secured the US-Japan alliance even in the face of intense pressure, playing a critical role as, dare I say it, a Trump whisperer in some difficult times. He forged trade deals across the world as part of his signature ongoing economic reform agenda of Abenomics to lift Japan's economy out of two decades of stagnation, but in doing so also strengthening international cooperation with so many partners. Australia was in fact the first major developed economy with which Japan secured a free trade agreement through that era via the Japan-Australia Economic Partnership Agreement signed between Prime Minister Abe and then Prime Minister Abbott in 2014. Alongside this, he drove, as Senator Wong acknowledged, the elevation of Australia's relationship with Japan to a special strategic relationship, a phrase that I understand he reportedly coined himself. Later that year, he addressed the Australian Parliament and said that through the agreement we had deepened our economic ties and would nurture our regional and the world order to safeguard peace. In addition to the Special Purpose Agreement and Free Trade Agreement, Shinzo Abe advanced the Australia-Japan relations via commencement of the Reciprocal Access Agreement, now in force, through strengthened defence and intelligence relationships, including trilateral cooperation between Australia and the United States. Crucially, Shinzo Abe, alongside former Prime Minister Turnbull, was instrumental in saving and securing the Trans-Pacific Partnership, not once, but twice. First, following the withdrawal of the United States 
and then again following the near withdrawal of Canada, ultimately seeing the conclusion and entry into force of the comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership that has provided one of the two great regional trade blocks now in operation through the Indo-Pacific. Shinzo Abe knew that both our nations had the strongest possible interest in a strong and robust rules-based international order. He was a crucial architect of the Quad, a long-held ambition and one which required great persistence to bring Japan, the United States, India and Australia together in a strategic security dialogue from which Australia has benefited greatly. I would like to think that in those final months of his life, as it turned out to be, he would have taken great pride in seeing the first face-to-face -face leaders meeting take place of the Quad. And even after standing down as Prime Minister in 2020 as a consequence of the return of a health condition, Shinzo Abe remained in service to the people of Japan in the Diet and active in the democratic process, his reputation and standing growing both in Japan and globally following his retirement as Prime Minister. That his life came to an abrupt end as he was actively participating in the democratic process makes his passing so much harder to bear for the Japanese people, for Australia who has lost a true friend and for the world which has lost one of the great leaders of recent decades. On behalf of the coalition parties in the Senate, I send our condolences to Shinzo Abe's family, particularly his wife, Akia, and to the people of Japan. We share your shock, your dismay, your grief. We also share your pride in the life and achievements of one of Japan's greatest leaders and give thanks for his special connection to Australia. We reaffirm our ongoing commitment to the democratic processes to which Shinzo Abe's life and death was dedicated and to the relations between our nations and our great connection and cooperative work across our region and the world that we can build upon as part of his legacy. I thank the Senate. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. On behalf of the Australian Greens, I offer my condolences to Shinzo Abe's family, friends and the people of Japan following his unexpected and tragic death. Mr Abe served his country over many years, including two stints as Prime Minister, weathering ill health as he did so. Like the rest of the world, we have felt the shock of his assassination. Mr Abe's death while campaigning was an assault on Japanese democracy, perhaps more tragic because death by gun violence is so rare in Japan. Now, Those in this chamber would know that uh, Greens were quite regularly at odds with Mr Abe and the Japanese government over whaling. Senator Wish Wilson even managed to personally hand him a letter from Sea Shepherd during his visit to Australia in 2014. Senator Wish Wilson describes breaking diplomatic protocols in approaching Mr Abe, which he nonetheless graciously and respectfully received. And of course there were other issues too where we didn't see eye to eye. But none of this diminishes the shock and the pain upon hearing of his assassination. Democracy relies on elected representatives and those campaigning being available to the people. Events like this don't just hurt those close to the victim, they threaten democracy itself. I can only imagine the sadness that his death has caused his loved ones and many in his country, and I hope that the condolences of the Australian Parliament, supported by the Greens, offer some small comfort in these sad times. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Mackenzie. Thank you, Madam President, and congratulations. On behalf of the Nationals, uh, I would like to contribute to this condolence motion and associate our party, um, particularly with those comments by the Leader of the Government and the Leader of the Opposition. Um, Shinzo Abe was a man who fought for a safer, more secure region and world, a great champion of democracy, of freedom and of growing friendship between Australia and Japan. It was a great honour for all of us to be invited to the Japanese Embassy over recent weeks since um, his shocking assassination to sign a condolence book, um, which I hope many of us took advantage of, uh, given the deep and abiding friendship between our two countries. For the Nationals, I'm not, um, the, the chronology of his life has been delivered already. Um, but for the Nationals, there is a deep and abiding relationship with the people of Japan that stretches more than six decades. 
The assassination of former Prime Minister Abe in Nara earlier this month was therefore a terrible shock, but afterwards a cause for some reflection on this man's remarkable achievements as a statesman and a friend to Australia. Uh, I would like to recount the events surrounding the former country party leader's biggest political risk, John McEwen, to his career in establishing a trade deal between Australia and its former enemy, Japan, in 1957. The co-signatory to that deal was Prime Minister Kishi, grandfather of the late uh, Prime Minister Abe. With the wartime memories of the prisoner of war camps in Changi and the Burma Railway still raw and real in the minds of many Australians, McEwen's diplomacy helped seal a deal that contributed to post-war prosperity for our two countries that has largely continued, albeit with some notable disruptions to the present day. But it could have been disastrous, and the Australian Prime Minister of the day was, a very, cl was very clear with the National Party leader at that time that any downside to the deal was going to land at McEwen's feet. The wonderful historic symmetry of that deal was completed 57 years later when Prime Minister Shinzo Abe himself signed an economic partnership agreement with another Australian Prime Minister, Tony Abbott. When Shinzo Abe's time arrived, his father was also Japan's Foreign Minister, he was prepared to embark on his own far-reaching ambitions domestically but also for the entire Indo-Pacific region as well. Some of his domestic efforts were successful, others not so much. Uh, Abe economic strategy to beat deflation and revive economic growth, along with introducing structural reform to cope with a fast-ageing, shrinking population. Abe tried to boost the country's dwindling birth rate by making workplaces more family-friendly. But on the international stage, the former Japanese Prime Minister agreed to another audacious act of international diplomacy, uh, which was to commit his country to a submarine partnership with Australia. This from a former enemy country which had sent submarines into the heart of Sydney Harbour during World War II. And as we now know, Abbott and Abe submarine partnership did not eventuate, and yet another far more important legacy was secured by the late Japanese Prime Minister. Shinzo Abe was both the architect and the father of the Quad. And Australia, together with India and the US, are allies in the Quad alliance alongside Japan, a grouping that will help balance power sharing in our region over coming decades. Much has been said and much will be said about the achievements of Shinzo Abe. His lifetime of service showed each of us that our time as politicians are not merely for the present or the day-to-day -day conflicts, but that we can all be audacious and aim to leave a legacy for our nation's future. Our sympathies to his family and the people of Japan uh, we hope we all learn from his leadership for a more safer, peaceful uh, and prosperous world, and sometimes that means doing very brave things. Thank you, Senator Mackenzie. Yeah. Senator Payne. Thank you, Madam President, and congratulations on your elevation to the role of uh, President. Uh, Madam President, it is important and a strong mark of respect uh, that this parliament records our sincere and shared grief at the shocking death by assassination of a faithful friend of Australia, a great leader, the former Prime Minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe. I also offer my sympathies to his family, his dear wife, and to all of the people of Japan. None in Japan have so profoundly deepened the Australia-Japan relationship than Mr Abe. Ours is a relationship informed by a complex shared history. But Mr Abe did not allow those historic enmities to undermine progress between our nations. Indeed, as the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, Senator Birmingham, said, Mr Abe was the first Japanese leader to visit Darwin. Instead, he understood perfectly that our unique past was, in fact, the strongest of foundations from which to forge closer ties. Like other colleagues in this place have already mentioned, I vividly recall Mr Abe's address to a joint sitting of our parliament in July of 2014. On the cusp of signing the Japan-Australia Economic Partnership Agreement with then Prime Minister Tony Abbott, Mr Abe spoke of the example set down by his grandfather some 57 years prior, recalling Prime Minister Nobusuke Kishi and Prime Minister Robert Menzies signing the Commerce Agreement amongst the first of its kind in the post-war decades. Mr Abe didn't waste a moment. 
He used that same speech, welcoming the JAEPA, to outline a raft of additional economic agreements he wanted to pursue. The Trans-Pacific Partnership, and pursue it, he did. The Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, and he did. And Free Trade Agreement, which he also did. These agreements would be the fruit, in the words of Mr Abe, of a relationship, quote, with no limits, unquote. This encapsulated the essential character of Shinzo Abe. A boundless energy for tackling challenges and opportunities alike. A clear vision for Japan, our region and for the world. And a commanding understanding of history and how it shapes our lives. The people of Australia remain the thankful beneficiaries of Mr Abe's efforts towards trade liberalisation. In my own time as minister, I've borne close witness to the careful work of Mr Abe, including in fostering vital, closer bilateral defence cooperation with, our, with Australia. In our governments, he found a strong and willing partner. The Japan Acquisition and Cross-Servicing Agreement, the AXA, signed in Sydney in early 2017 by Mr Abe and then Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, clearly demonstrated the importance that Mr Abe placed on our special strategic partnership. Later that year, when I visited Tokyo for our annual 2 plus 2 talks, meeting with Prime Minister Abe to discuss these initiatives in the defence cooperation environment, I was struck then, and I said then, that I was left in no doubt as to Mr Abe's strong personal support for our shared mission of creating a safer, more secure environment for our nations. And as the Senator Birmingham has recorded, it was always a great pleasure and honour to meet Prime Minister Abe. Most recently, due in very large part to the leadership and work of Shinzo Abe, in January, now Japan Prime Minister Kishida and then Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison signed the vital reciprocal access agreement, which most importantly enables the ADF and the JSDF to work more closely, more cooperatively, more collaboratively on the great security challenges of our region and the globe. Madam President, underpinning our deepening security and defence relationship over these years and continuing now is Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, to which Senator Wong alluded, strongly, proudly championed by Mr Abe. This doctrine is the central organising principle for Japan's engagement in our region, and it's provided many nations with the vocabulary, if you like, required to navigate this time of strategic competition in the Indo-Pacific. It is one of the most significant contributions made by Mr Abe, not just to the safety of our region, but to the world. Mr Abe matched words with deeds. The quadrilateral security dialogue, for which Mr Abe played such a substantive role in helping to form, is a key forum through which the four like-minded democracies of Australia, the United States, Japan and India are advancing our shared vision for a free, open, inclusive uh, Indo-Pacific region. When the first in-person meeting of the Quad foreign ministers took place in New York in September 2019, this was a significant event. I took my seat with then US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, Indian Minister for External Affairs Dr Jashanka, and my friend Toshi Motegi, the Japanese foreign minister. This was indeed an historical meeting on many levels. In very considerable part, the commitment of Shinzo Abe and his government, including of Foreign Minister Motegi, made this possible. For the Quad to have grown to leaders' meetings, virtually and in person, is an enormous contribution in strategic and security terms to our region and the globe, including through the Quad's COVID-19 support and in addressing the actions of authoritarian states that threaten that security and stability. In my view, thanks also to Shinzo Abe and subsequently his successors, Prime Minister Suga, now Prime Minister Kishida, Japan continues to make that strong and growing contribution in global security and strategic terms. Shinzo Abe 
reimagined the modern-day JSDF, and although he did not achieve all of his goals in that respect, the enormous difference that he made will be writ large in the pages of history. Most recently, it's notable that NATO's invitation to countries of our region, Australia, New Zealand, the ROK and Japan, to first join the meeting of NATO foreign ministers in Brussels in April, which I attended, to add our voice and support to the opposition to Russia's illegal, unlawful invasion of Ukraine was the first such invitation, and indeed the first time that a Japanese foreign minister and leader subsequently had sat around the NATO table since its formation in April of 1949. I was pleased to sit around that table with Foreign Minister Yogi Hayashi. Shinzo Abe's projection of Japan in the regional and global security conversation in the military space was profound and meaningful. Given the issues that face us now as a world and as a region, it was also essential. Under his leadership, Japan was a faithful actor in many international fora, as both Senator Wong and Senator Birmingham have noted, committed to collective engagement and action. He was a decisive and consequential figure in the G7, in the G20, with ASEAN, with United, in the United Nations, and a leading voice for adherence to international rules and norms, particularly the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. I want to acknowledge today my many Japanese colleagues with whom I worked as minister and mark the appalling loss they have experienced in the last few weeks. I particularly acknowledge my good friends Taro Kono, Toshimitsu Motegi and Yoshimasa Hayashi, all foreign ministers of Japan and some also defence ministers of Japan uh, at, uh, as with whom I served. To Ambassador Yamagami uh, and his team here in Canberra, my sincere condolences. Madam President, the assassination of Shinzo Abe while giving a campaign speech in the pursuit of the democratic process in the city of Nara was nothing less than a wanton assault on democracy. I think most of us will never forget where we were when we heard that Shinzo Abe had been shot. The free exchange of ideas and the democratic process was tarnished badly that day, not just in Japan but to liberal democracies everywhere. That cowardly, callous, criminal act is a brutal reminder of the absolute necessity to ceaselessly safeguard democracy, safeguard freedom, safeguard the rule of law and human rights, values which Shinzo Abe championed relentlessly and in which, and which in Mr Abe's memory we must work even harder to nurture and protect. Rest in peace, Shinzo Abe, a great friend, a great leader. Thank you, Senator Payne. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, um, President. And on my first contribution in this, the 47th Parliament of Australia, can I acknowledge your uh, significant role as the President and wish you every, well, every wish in uh, the international relations that you'll be undertaking for our great nation. I also want to congratulate the Deputy President and, and all those who have assumed leadership roles in the course of their service of the Australian people through the 47th Parliament. And can I also acknowledge the incredible privilege we have as parliamentarians in this fine democracy uh, to have been elected to this Senate to do the kind of work that Shinzo Abe gave his life to. Uh, it is no small thing for us to be here, and his service and his final demise are an instruction in how fragile not only life is, but how democracy can be also uh, the severely attacked and assaulted. I speak today, Madam President, uh, on the condolence motion for the esteemed former Prime Minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe. Abe was a towering leader in Japan, a political titan who was called the shadow shogun by commentators, both during his record tenure as prime minister and afterwards. His legacy is the shape of modern Japan and its direction for the next few decades. He was both a powerful and dedicated servant of democracy and an amazing leader of a country. 
unlike uh, those who have contributed to the debate so far, who had much more personal experience of interaction with this fine man, I only saw him through his address here to the parliament. And the three words that came to mind when I thought of his contribution that day was that he was a man of incredible warmth, intelligence and humour. Uh, to that, Senator Birmingham had today added the word purposeful. And it was one that sort of resonated with me when you made that contribution, Senator Birmingham. Prime Minister Albanese has described the courage and strength of character to which Senator, uh, Senator Wong re referred. And in her contribution, I think perhaps uh, her description of him as a regional visionary is something that we should definitely dwell on. A leader in the Indo-Pacific and uh, responsible for the elevation of the Quad. Senator Payne, I think, aptly described the loss as appalling. The baffling and unprecedented nature of this assassination has led to a deep confusion and anguish amongst the Japanese and among the global admirers. As US President Joe Biden remarked on this murder, uh, it will have a profound impact on the psyche of the Japanese people, I believe, for a generation. This killing comes at a worrying time. We are seeing democracy under threat across the world, from the growing authoritarianism of leaders like Viktor Orban, the further descent of Russia under the leadership of Vladimir Putin along totalitarian paths, and the shattering of the US, United States democratic consensus by Donald Trump that became manifest in the events of January 6 in the physical assault on the Capitol. Shinzo Abe positioned Japan as a linchpin of the democratic global world order and was steadfast in his support for other democracies in the face of that growing tide of opposition. He became, over his tenure, a key advocate and thought leader of a democratic internationalism adapted for the 21st century, and his murder is an untimely blow against it. His administration was a bulwark against North Korean aggression and gave assistance to those fighting the rise of ISIS. Japan, under his stewardship, became increasingly an active multilateral partner in the Indo-Pacific, knitting together nearly a dozen nations which were with, with what eventually became known as the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. His influence was still powerful even following his departure from the Premiership in 2020. Experts credit his still massive influence in the government evident in the decision by Japan to declare it would phase out Russian coal and oil imports in the face of its illegal aggression in the Ukraine. Mr Abe's vision was to shape Japan into a nation that could address the future. His first speech as president boldly stated his ambitions for his country, and I quote, my mission is not other than to draw a new vision of a nation that can withstand the raging waves for the next 50 to 100 years. All politicians might strive to declare and deliver on such a vision. Mr Abe's legacy is a revitalised democratic universal order, featuring a more proactive and outward-looking Japan at its centre, a nation better able to withstand the raging waves of a tumultuous century. I am sure all of Australia and this House stands with me in thanking Mr Abe for his myriad contributions upon the world and domestic stage. I pass my deepest condolences to the family of Mr Abe and my best wishes to the government and the people of Japan as they navigate the aftermath of this tragic and senseless act. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam President. I rise to pay tribute to the former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, whose time amongst us was tragically cut short by such a heinous crime. Shinzo Abe was not only Japan's longest-serving post-war Prime Minister, but he was also its most consequential and had in decades, uh, and the most consequential leader Japan had had in decades, whose statecraft and wisdom transcended the islands of Japan to become a global leader. Abe-san grew from simply being Japan's leader to being a global leader, 
a statesman of such standing that one does not come by very often. He saw the threats to Japan and the free world as they are, not what people wish they would be. And with his citizen security and welfare in mind, he acted boldly and with confidence. During his tenure as Japan's longest serving Prime Minister, Abe-san revolutionised his nation's foreign policy by centralising the national defence system, reinterpreting the constitution to make collective defence possible, and adopting an activist role in world affairs. Moreover, he devised a grand strategy for managing China's rising economic and military power more deliberately and successfully than any other world leader. One of his crowning achievements that's been mentioned is how he breathed life back into the Quad and drove it to be one of the strongest forces for stability in the Indo-Pacific. He did champion the term a free and open Indo-Pacific, something important to all Australians and peace-loving people in the region. The strength of the Quad of integrated deterrence of having friends is one of the key strengths that Australia has on the world stage. And this was amplified by our joining the Quad that Abe San so ably um, helped build. The legacy left by such a giant of global politics cannot be summarised in the few words I have here. However, we are forever grateful for his contributions to developing the Quad a stronger Japan and a more stable Pacific. We are indebted to his sacrifice, his service and, devo and devotion to promoting democratic, democratic values across the globe. At a time of increased geopolitical upheaval, the world needs more leaders with the courage and conviction that Shinzo Abe possessed, not less. Abe-san's passing will be deeply mourned around the world while the Japan has lost a great leader and Australia has lost a, great fr a, tr a true friend, his wisdom and global leadership will be sorely missed. I pass my condolences to the government and people of Japan, Japan and especially to His Excellency, the Ambassador from Japan to Australia, uh, Shingo Yamagami. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Van. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Dep President. Uh, as Senator Wong said in her contribution on this condolence motion, uh, Mr Abe's untimely death created deep shock right around Australia. It was one of those events that I think all Australians, their attention was grabbed by. And that was, of course, partly due to the shocking nature of Mr Abe's death, something that should never happen in any society. It was partly due to Mr Abe's genuine stature as a real national leader. And I think it was also partly due to the deep, long-term, sustained relationship between our two countries. And that's what I want to focus my brief remarks on in this condolence motion, especially in relation to the portfolio that I have the great privilege now of representing, the portfolio of agriculture. Australia's agriculture relationship with Japan is one of our strongest and most highly developed in the Indo-Pacific region. Our trade with Japan in agriculture is extremely strong. And in fact, Japan is our biggest market for beef and cheese and our farmers are strongly committed to supplying to Japan and want to maintain and increase market share. We have deep and long-standing ties in agriculture. Japan is one of Australia's largest and most valued trading partners as it has been for more than five decades. And this relationship has underpinned the broader relationship between our two countries, as is evident in trade more generally, in national security and in people-to-people -people links. Now, the reason I mentioned that in this condolence motion was Prime Minister Abe's mm. integral role in forging and strengthening those links. Prime Minister Abe, has, as has been noted by a number of speakers, was a true friend to Australia. Under his prime ministership, our bilateral relationship was upgraded to a special strategic partnership in 2014. By 2015, we had signed the Japan-Australia Economic Partnership Agreement, or JEPA, 
which underpins our economic relationship and supports our broader cooperation on economic security and the prosperity of the Indo-Pacific. Prime Minister Abe was a reformer and he had a vision for the Japanese economy. As has been noted, he was known for his signature Abenomics policy. And this included agricultural reforms in which his government made small but important reforms to the Japanese agriculture sector, focusing on competitiveness and exports. We share similar goals to Japan in growing our agriculture industries. Japan is looking to grow agriculture exports in the same way that our agriculture industry wants to expand its farm gate returns as well. And again, Mr Abe can take credit for the fact that bilaterally we continue to increase our cooperation on food value chains and to co collaborate with Japan on activities that strengthen global agriculture supply chains. Multilaterally, Japan has been a like-minded partner in many forums, including the G20, APEC and the UN, as well as a leading proponent of trade agreements, including the CPTPP. And again, Mr Abe can take personal credit for much of that. The other reason I wanted to speak in this motion, apart from my role as the new Agriculture Minister for our country, is that I wanted to speak on a personal level as someone who's had a long-term interest in and friendship with Japan. I studied Japanese at school a very long time ago, uh, or should I say, boku wa gakko de nihongo o benkyo shimashita. Um, and I was reflecting on this. Um, there's not much more to my Japanese knowledge or, or <laughs> that I've recalled from my school days. Um, but I was reflecting on this in preparing these notes, and I remember that the reason, more than any, that I studied Jap Japanese, of all the languages that were off on offer at my school, was that at that point in time, the mid-1980s, when I was starting high school, I think Australia was really coming to understand exactly how important Japan was to our future. And there was a really big push uh, for students in high schools to study Japanese at school. Uh, and it's something that I really enjoyed. Uh, and I might say it was one of my better subjects at school. Um, because I did really enjoy it, and, I, and it really gave me a deep interest in Japan, its history, its culture, and its relationship to our own country. I also had the privilege of visiting Japan uh, as part of a delegation of uh, federal and state uh, aspiring politicians shortly before I started in this place. Uh, and I was accompanied on that delegation by Senators Dean Smith and Bridget McKenzie. Uh, which is probably the reason that, despite our political differences uh, and our, our tendency to uh, trade blows, we're actually pretty good mates. And I put it down to that uh, delegation that we undertook uh, to Japan, along with a number of other MPs as well. And that visit confirmed to me, through the meetings that we had with uh, government, uh, industry and other officials in Japan, it confirmed to me the enduring strength of our two countries' relationship. Mr Abe's untimely death is an extremely sad blow to the Japanese people. We grieve with them, and I sincerely pass on my condolences to Mr Abe's family, his friends and the Japanese people at large. In closing, I might just say, Kono tabe wa okuyami moshi agemasu. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Farrell. Uh, I wish to associate my comments to those of uh, um, Minister Watt and uh, just um, indicate the sadness uh, in uh, former Prime Minister Abe's um, very untimely death. But I would like to um, acknowledge and welcome the uh, presence in the chamber of uh, Ambassador and uh, uh, Mrs uh, Yamagami. And on behalf of the Australian Senate, uh, I extend our sincerest condolences to you as the representative to Australia of the government and the people of Japan. Thank you, Senator Farrell. I ask senators to join in a moment of silence to signify assent to the motion. Thank you. The motion is carried.